Deadly earthquakes in West Java, magma chamber recharge on Mauna Loa, the oldest fossils on Earth, very slippery landslides, the age of Yosemite, and stream channel evolution after dam removal. Welcome to Geology Talk, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts, brought to you by the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, with support from the Portland State Department of Geology and the Beverly Vote PSU Graduate Student Fund. Today, our panelists are Andrew Dunning, Emma Rahalski, Carrie Gordon, and myself. We're going to have Andrew giving us the geology news, and then our special guest, Lowell Anthony from the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries in Oregon will be talking about how the stream channel evolved in the Sandy River after the removal of the Marmot Dam. And I'll pass it over to Andrew. Good morning, everybody. This is the geology news for November 26, 2022. It's been a very interesting couple of months. I sort of pushed the envelope back into about mid-October here in terms of interesting events. Um, but I'm going to get started, as I always do, with some earthquakes. There were some, there were a good number of fairly significant earthquakes this last uh, six weeks or so. The largest was a magnitude 7.3 off the coast of Tonga. Uh, I believe that's this one right here. And it's located uh, in the Pacific Plate. This is in the subduction zone, near the subduction zone, actually. So right when the Pacific Plate starts to bend before it goes underneath the Australian Plate, um, that area of bending, you get extensional uh, sort of tension. Um, and that is exactly this kind of earthquake. It's a normal fault so that is indic indicative of extension resulting from that bending of the downgoing Pacific plate. This plate margin here converges at 77 millimeters a year. That's really fast. Um, ours here in the Northwest, here in the Juan de Fuga plate, I think that's about 40. I'm gonna defer to someone else on that one. I'm not positive. It did have a half to one meter tsunami in Tonga and surrounding islands. Uh, I didn't see too many reports of significant damage from that, so that's good. Uh, but that's really all it affected, which is also good. There were three other magnitude seven earthquakes uh, around Fiji, so there's these two, and then this one up here in the Solomon Islands. That's th uh, four really massive earthquakes. Those are very large. Uh, but this one near the Solomon Islands uh, was a strike-slip earthquake, uh, so that's lateral motion uh, resulting from basically all these microplates, uh, all these different tiny chunks of oceanic crust are all grinding next to each other and getting turned around and flipped over uh, as part of the collision between the Australian and the Pacific Plate. Really fascinating tectonics over here. This is the probably the most seismically active area in the world, this sort of Southeast Pacific, uh, Eastern Indian Ocean area. There was unfortunately a deadly earthquake this month. Uh, this is a magnitude 5.6 in West Java. That's this one right here uh, in Indonesia. There was a, it was a very shallow, very violent earthquake. It was another strike slip earthquake, uh, only 10 kilometers deep. Uh, so that's pretty shallow. That's only, what, seven miles or so? Excuse me. And that, unfortunately, destroyed probably 12,000 homes. And at last report, 268 have been confirmed killed. Uh, thousands and thousands have been injured. It's really, really very tragic, horrible earthquake. Now, I, I'd like to point out that you know, former recovering Californians like myself and others say, oh yeah, we never get out of bed for a five. They could still be very deadly depending very much on uh, the location they're in. This is in a very deep sedimentary basin and during any kind of earthquake, uh, these valleys full of sediment jiggle like jello and it can really wreak havoc on the surface. So that, that sucks. I hate it when big earthquakes are deadly. There were some other significant earthquakes, a 6.1 over here in North Anatolia, Turkey, some moderate local damage, some injuries, not too bad, and a magnitude 5.7 in Nepal, moderate local damage, some injuries, not too bad. So that's nice. 
This is all earthquake activity in the United States for the last 30 days. Standard background seismicity, really nothing unusual going on here. Uh, largest event was this 6.2 off the coast of Baja. is a strike slip fault, uh, sort of part of the broader San Andreas fault system. There's a magnitude 4.9 in West Texas here, uh, part of ongoing gas field, probably induced seismicity, same thing up here in Oklahoma. There was a 4.9 last night in Vancouver Island. I think it was about 7 p.m., um, which was felt by a good number of people up in that area. And there was a 5.2 off Bandon in the Blanco fracture zone right here. Uh, very standard earthquake. They don't really ever get felt by people on land. I'd like to also point out this, uh, there was one in Georgia. Where did it go? It's supposed to be there. There was a small one in Georgia, magnitude two, magnitude two here in South Carolina. There was a magnitude two here up in Montreal or near Montreal that actually got felt by people, which is unusual since those are, that's a very small earthquake. And, a, you know, a couple of good smatterings around the rest of the West. What size mag or what magnitude is generally when people start feeling it? Uh, depending on the local geology, the low to mid twos, um, I mean, and that's only felt by the people basically directly above it. Uh, for getting wide, widespread, more regional uh, felt it reports, you're starting to get into the threes, the mid threes. Gotcha. So it looks like there's one around Portland. Is that... Uh... Was that yes. one that people could feel? I don't know. I didn't see any felt it reports from it. This was a magnitude two between Hubbard and Aurora. Uh, it was just a few days ago. Um, and I didn't see any felt it reports. I wouldn't be surprised if people directly above it did feel it. Um, it would have just sort of felt like a, like a little boom, a little rumble, maybe a little shake. And but I, nothing, I was certainly nothing that was felt by the region. Andrew, I was wondering your description of the the deadly earthquake in in West Java, and you said it was re related to it being in a sedimentary basin. Are there, I mean, why are they? Why does that result in such a a, a deadly outcome? Uh, basically, these valleys full of sediment are just really loose, and when you shake them, uh, it's just a big mass of sand, gravel, and water. And when you shake that, it just jiggles like jello. It sort of, uh, because it's flanked by hard bedrock, the seismic waves are also able to bounce around and reflect around the sides of the valley. Uh, it's a phenomenon called basin amplification. Um, here in the Portland basin, we're maybe right on the edge where we can get um, a slight degree of basin amplification. Um, but usually you see them in much larger basins, like uh, what's a good basin? The central California Valley get basin amplification in those earthquakes. At what point would a blast in a mineral material source record? I see the one south of Prineville. I know our quarries have been active again of late. Is, And I know they have recorded before as earthquakes. So what number of these smaller ones yeah. could be construction or? Well, this one is from the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. The rest of these are from the USGS. In the USGS ones, I intentionally filter out everything that isn't a earthquake earthquake. Um, uh, I don't do that with the Pacific Northwest ones just because just I'm lazy. Uh, but the ones that are explosions show up as these little crosses. And they show up differently in the seismic waves. Uh, it's more of a spike. And an earthquake is a bit longer in both time and amplitude and all of that. The difference is easy to tell for someone who looks at seismograms. I don't, so I don't really <laughs> know too much about that, but uh, they're easy to discern. This 2.3 outside of Prineville, the one you were seeing, uh, is not near a quarry. It was actually uh, sort of down on the South Fork, the Crooked River, a couple kilometers depth, just, you know, it's a good size of a rock fracture, basically is what that amounts to. And similarly, there was a 2.1 inside Mount Rainier. So inside the base of the volcano, uh, 
its depth recorded as negative 1.9 kilometers. So that's an, a positive altitude above sea level of 3,500, 4,000 feet, I think. Uh, so that's just fluid circulating inside the base of the volcano, pretty standard. Uh, we get those at Mount Hood all the time as well. And I just like this last month had a great show from the uh, Mount St. Helens seismic zone. Most of these are magnitude sort of 1.5 to zero, uh, very small just rock fracturing events, uh, nothing significant, but it perfectly outlines sort of the extent of the St. Helens seismic zone. I, I just like that. I don't know much about that seismic zone, but I know it's there and it looks good on the, uh, <laughs> on the earthquake map. That's all I've got for earthquakes. Any other questions about them? If not, I'll go on to volcanoes. There are 28 ongoing active erupting volcanoes over the around the world, pretty normal number. There was substantial activity really only this month in the Kamchatka Peninsula up here in uh, far eastern Russia. Uh, significantly was the uh, Shivalush volcano and Abeka volcano. Uh, this Shivalush volcano uh, started with an ash venting event on November 22nd, and now there is this lava dome slowly growing out of the middle of the volcano. It looks very cool. This is a, a nighttime photo, uh, obviously a long exposure, so you can see uh, areas of incandescence where the rock is so hot that it's glowing as it slowly flows out of the ground. That's very cool. Not much going on volcanically, uh, this time around. Oh, wait, I did forget something. Uh, so here on Hawaii, it doesn't show up on here because it's uh, not significant, but you may have seen in the news a lot about Mauna Loa, the main volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, it has been having slightly higher than usual uh, activity, and that is both inflation and earthquakes inside the mass of the volcano, inside the massif. Um, so that means magma is recharging the shallower magma chambers on the volcano. Now, we know it will erupt again. <clears throat> um, it's only a matter of when, uh, but there's no sign of Mauna Loa actively posing a threat to life and property in the Big Island of Hawaii right now. But if you do see it on the news, that's where it's at right now. The uh, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is issuing daily updates now, uh, which they only do when there is sort of heightened unrest or elevated background activity is kind of what they're calling it. That's all on that. Any questions on volcanoes? Yeah, I was curious with the Shivala. Was that how you say it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> with that volcano, it looks like it totally changes behavior from very explosive to very fluid. What, what can cause that change in behavior? Um, so this is really the, the earliest onset of the eruption. This is the most active volcano in uh, uh, Kamchatka. Uh, so people are, they're watching it over there. And when the eruption first starts, it's basically like cracking open a soda can and you get that pssst. So all of the dissolved gases sort of explode outward and you might get a tiny pyroclastic flow, but most of this is ash and steam and just volcanic gases. And as that escapes, the lava, the magma, I guess rather, is able to move up toward the surface. And that, depending on the composition of the lava, can either react explosively or effusively. And what we've got here is just a, a slowly growing pile of kind of thick dacite lava. This is uh, not really too dissimilar. Andrew, what is dacite? It's a composition of lava in the middle of, <laughs> of the composition spectrum. You have on one end ultramafic, which is basically mantle-derived material. And on the other end, you have felsic, which is highly evolved magma that's been sitting around and forms things like granite. So this is right in the middle of that. I like the soda can visual. That was great way to describe it. It's a classic. All right, not too much research came out in the last two months, uh, presumably because it's conference season, and things don't get published until after conference season usually, but there were still some interesting stories. This one really caught my eye. Um, <clears throat> the oldest stromatolites in the world have been discovered, identified, and analyzed, and this is located in Western Australia's Dresser Formation, which is a uh, 
series of sedimentary and metamorphic rocks that dates back three and a half billion years, which is insane. That's twice as old as the oldest rock I've ever seen. Um, and these stromatolites, which are basically just concentric rings and piles of algae, uh, they have layers, which is what you're seeing here. These are the, the layers of the algae structure, which are getting replaced with minerals over time. Uh, but the algae cells have been completely replaced with uh, iron oxide and a few other trace metals, uh, which is interesting because the geochemistry of not only these stromatolites, but the surrounding rocks are very similar uh, to that on of rocks that we've studied on Mars. So this is probably the closest earthly analog to if we ever found uh, stromatolite algae fossils on Mars, it would probably look a lot like this and have very similar geochemical signatures. Um, so that's very cool. And it gives us a good thing to compare to and look for on the Martian surface. Uh, so the geochemistry is telling, them, telling us that they formed in a marine environment near hydrothermal springs. So this is a hot spring underwater with lots of minerals and stuff coming out of the inside of the earth. Most stromatolite fossils that you see around <clears throat> grew uh, generally in shallow water, uh, sort of like a salt pool. Um, <clears throat> and the oldest, the only stromatolites really that are in a big population on Earth today are in Western Australia on a place called Shark Bay, where there's just these little black domes of algae all around the edge of the water in this hyper saline. Uh, Bay of the Ocean, really cool. This is a thing I'd never heard of in Southern Nevada, not too far from uh, Las Vegas. There's an enormous landslide, uh, which is really only known by <laughs> the landslide breccias, that's super hyperfractured rock covering a big area of the landscape. Uh, this is called the Blue Diamond Landslide because it came off of the cliffs in this area and then flowed up and onto on top of this large ridge called Blue Diamond Hill. Uh, so it had enough energy to not only escape the mountain, but then flow up the next mountain over, which is pretty impressive. And this is an old landslide, uh, three to five million years old. So a lot of it is covered with younger sort of alluvial sedimentary material. Um, but this big chunk of the Aztec sandstone uh, collapsed onto a saturated, wet, muddy landscape, uh, which sort of lubricated the bottom of the landslide. It had a reduced, the paper said it had a reduced coefficient of basal friction, um, that that allows it to run out really far. On, uh, but that ran out onto to, uh, a topography and the increased weight of the landslide material sitting on top of that triggered a second landslide phase which is what allowed it to run out even further down into this area and up onto the neighboring hill. Um, there was a bunch of gypsum. Uh, there's a big layer of gypsum in the subsurface below the landslide. And when saturated with water, that basically fails completely. It becomes very weak. And that is what enabled this second phase of <clears throat> landslide activity. Very interesting. Any questions on, excuse me, either of those? Andrew, just a quick question, because uh, I'm going to try and get a hold of a copy of that paper. Do did the authors suggest that maybe that large landslide was floating on a thin layer of air to make that transition clear across the the valley bottom there? No, because the uh, other evidence for water and uh, really slippery minerals like gypsum was so obvious. They, they did not seem to be a big adherent to the hovercraft landslide hypothesis. So, uh, and, I, and Carrie, I just found this one on the uh, homepage of uh, Geological Society of America, I think. You should be able to find it pretty easily. Oh, so Andrew, this is just a little side comment. Uh, so if you're ever in Salt Lake City, you can go to the Clark Planetarium and see the Acosta Nice, which is almost 4 billion years old. So then you can have seen like probably one of the oldest rock known. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know there's any of that in the US. That's really cool. Yeah. And it, it 
you can walk in. It's a free part of the museum, so you don't even have to pay anything. Thanks. I remember that. <laughs> Just one more uh, geology news story, and that is on the age of Yosemite Valley. And I never really thought about how old the Yosemite Valley must be, uh, but apparently it was a sort of a debated, not settled topic for about a hundred years. Various geologists over the century had estimated it from being 2 million to 50 million years old. I always just assumed it was a product of the most recent glaciation, of the last ice age, but apparently not. Radiogenic helium trapped in apatite crystals in the granite that forms the dramatic vertical walls of the valley um, is a proxy for rock temperature. So as uranium and thorium and other radioactive uh, elements decay, um, they produce a helium ion, and that gets trapped in the crystal structure of apatite, excuse me, and a few other minerals. Um, but it only gets trapped in there within a certain temperature range, outside of which the helium can escape and it's no longer trapped in the rock. Uh, and this tells us that roughly 40 million years after the granite was in place, the topography began to uplift. And that's the point in which the apatite crystals cooled enough to be able to trap the radiogenic helium. So we know how old the rocks are from other, uh, like argon-argon dating and some other methods. Um, but this allows us to know when it started to rise above the hot interior of the earth, when they started to cool and become uh, positive uplifted topography. So that's the ancestral Sierra Nevada here, about 40 million years old. Um, but probably 40 to 90% of the modern relief of the Sierra Nevada mountains is less than 10 million years old. And if you've ever been down there, it's a huge mountain range. These things are cruising upward through geologic time. Um, but anyway, their analysis suggested that the Sierra Nevada uplift really drove canyon carving on the west slope in the sort of Yosemite area, sort of between 5 million years to present. And canyon carving just from water erosion is very important for the formation of large glacial valleys because it gives glacial ice a place to sort of focus all of its mass and energy. Once you, if you have a deep V-shaped uh, canyon carved by water, once that fills up with snow and glacial ice, then uh, that allows the glacier to really focus its energy and carve downwards and form a big U-shaped valley with a flat bottom and vertical sides, just like the Yosemite Valley is today. That's very cool, very interesting. I love a good glacial ice story. And that's all I've got for this month. Are there any questions on anything? I was, I just had a clarifying question uh -huh. from Yosemite Valley is the glaciation that happened that made these valleys U-shaped, was that during the last ice age, the places? Yes. Okay. But they were also carved out and full of ice during many subsequent uh, glaciations, or uh, previous, not subsequent. Uh -huh. um, there, was a, there were a number of large glaciations. The previous one, before the most recent glaciation, was actually quite a bit larger. Uh, that's like 90,000. There was another one around 140,000 years ago. Um, so these glacial events do happen every few 10,000 years. And, um, have helped deepen and increase the drama of the glacial canyons in the Yosemite area. That's cool. I, I did not know that there were previous ones recorded in this valley. So. Well, that is wonderful to know. Thank you, Andrew and uh, Emma and Carrie for delivering us right at 1129 so that we can <laughs> make the transition. And if anyone has any questions for Andrew later, I, if you can stick around a little bit after uh, after the, the noon hour. Um, well, I'm going to hand it over to Lowell now. I met Lowell at a field trip recently. Um, he and his wife and his very, very charming dog, who is uh, he will maybe tell us about. Lowell works for the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. And I will take a moment to pat ourselves on the back as the Geological Society for uh, helping save Dogami from the chopping, the governor's chopping block in the 2021 legislative session. And uh, we also have many of our, including our current president, um, our um, members or re retired members of Dogami. So we really appreciate the support we've gotten from that, that agency over the years. It's a historic, long lasting relationship going back to the 1930s. Lowell, tell us about yourself and what you're going to talk about. 
So my name is Laurel Anthony. I am a geohazards analyst, fluvial geomorphologist, uh, certified floodplain manager, and as of last work, last week, GIT, geologist in training for the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. I've worked there for the past 12 years. Um, I came about this in a rather circuitous route. Um, my undergrad is in geography with a minor in GIS mapping and geology. And then through my master's degree in conjunction with Martin LaFrance and Scott Burns and my colleagues at the Department of Geology, I tried to marry it all together with what we're going to talk about today, which is the evolution of uh, the channel after the removal of the Remarmont Dam. So I was kind of coming at this from angles because, you know, I'm a, a physical geographer, a geologist, and a geomorphologist all at the same time. You know, we look at geography is just, you know, what we think of space and time on the planet as we see it, but that underlying structure is the geology, and how all that changes on the face of the planet over time is the geomorphology. So it all, you know, has a blend, it kind of comes together, and I do my best through what I do with the Department of Geology to bring all those facets together. Um, primary focus is, again, water, the fluvial geomorphic aspect, and now I'm kind of getting into the, you know, hydrogeology side of things where water is going after it does what it does on the face of the earth and where it's going, you know, for storage later on. So again, I kind of um, constantly evolving in this process my own self, which I guess is, you know, what we're supposed to be doing science wise. Oh, I also grew up in Central Oregon. I currently live in Sandy. So I go out to this uh, to the Marmot Dam every weekend with my field assistant, who is Ara, which we mentioned, and that she is a wire-haired pointing griffon. And uh, yeah, she likes to go out and play with me when I decide to, you know, do things outside of the work sphere. So here is a picture of myself and Ara at um, just down from what was the original dam that was built in 1913. This dam was replaced in 1987 by a rolled concrete dam past this recreated Lahar Tuff, which is part of the Troutdale Formation. Um, Ara decided that she wanted to get in the middle of this picture, so she kind of photobombed me, and we just went with it from there. But um, again, I've been working with the Department of Geology going on uh, 12 years now. Uh, my focus is pretty much uh, the fluvial side of things, but I'm a little bit of jack of all trades. I'm very interested in the processes we see on the time. And then why those things happen? Why does it shape the way it does based off of its, you know, ge the geologic structure within it and, you know, the inputs and outputs going into the systems. So um, when the dam was removed, uh, Jim O'Connor, John Major, Rose Wallach, all those at the USGS did a really, really great and wonderful uh, write up on this. I touched on it, didn't really use it very much other than for reference, because I kind of wanted to get at this more from we have LIDAR. LIDAR is great. We've just recently discovered it in, re in the Pacific Northwest, and we've been using it a lot. The nice thing about the removal of the Marmot Dam is you had four different LIDAR flights flown. You had a, a flight pre-removal of the dam. You had a second flight right after the dam was removed. There was a third flight right after the 2011 floods on the Sandy that took out portions of Ten Eyck Road and a lot of the houses up there in the Brightwood area. Um, and then you had a 2012 uh, flight with had a little bit of a bathymetric survey added to it too to kind of play with that tech, but just to kind of see what the, the how the river responded after that 2011 flood. So I was able to take all of these together and then kind of come at this from a different angle of what can we infer from the lidar to be able to understand using the GIS principles, you know, GIS itself and using ARC uh, predominantly to get at what that change is. And for the, th the thing I look at with LIDAR is it's a way for us to be able to take the, um, and more focus where we wanna put our boots on the ground. Because a lot of times, you know, the, the, the inherent issues with these studies is where can we get access to, where is there avail availability for that access? And in areas where you can't really get access, what can you do with the tech that's available to maybe, you know, get some inferences and find out what the reach is doing? So- Lowell, could you yes, clarify for those who don't know what LIDAR is? So LIDAR is light detection and ranging. And for this, you fly a plane and you fire a laser at the ground. So your first returns of that laser are the tops of your trees, 
your building heights, the last return will be the earth itself. You can then run an algorithm which allows you to basically scrape everything off the face of the earth and look at the model, what we call a bare earth model, as if there wasn't trees, vegetation, or any man-made impediments. From this, you can you know, detect landslides, you can find earthquake faults, you can also get it what I was looking at here, which is the channel evolution, channel migration model, where a channel is and where it's been. Maybe some of you might have seen uh, Dogami's really nice, uh, it's kind of famous Willamette River poster, kind of looks like blue smoke. Um, that gets at the early conceptions of what we were looking at with channel evolution models. So you, you create a relative elevation model, which gets into where the channel is and also allows you to pull out where the channel has been over time. And from a hazard mitigation type of a setting that lets you kind of make inferences based off of if you get enough discharge and you have enough constraints in a certain area, a river will decide to diffuse that energy as much as possible and can jump back into an old channel. This is what happens on the Sandy River fairly often and up in the villages of Mount Hood, it's kind of one of the predominant driving factors beyond just the flooding that you see up there. The purpose of what I was doing was basically go out, put some boots on the ground, take a look at some of the spots after the dam was removed. I started looking at this in 2011, 2012, um, collecting GPS points um, and going through and just trying to mimic as best as I could the transects that they used to be able to pull out the changes within the river. But I was wanting to focus more on the marginal uh, accretionary differences in the bars so because when you're looking at like channel evolution and what was considered you know equilibrium with the river you have a natural flux of the pool and riffle system which is about five to seven widths of the river of its active channel you should see at that distance uh, a marked cut down of it's kind of like step pools, but in the case of this, it'd be a pool riffle. So small little uh, uh, elevational changes, minor nick points that then go uh, push push around and go into the pools. The reason this is good is because for the fish, they love to sit in those pools. It's low energy for them. They can hang out there, and it's just kind of like a smart sport. Everything gets knocked off of the rapids and those riffles and just comes floating down to them, and they can just collect as they go on. So I wanted to see. What could I infer from the LIDAR through the changes in the main channel and then aggregation and degradation up and down the reach uh, to, to find out whether or not you could use LIDAR to pull out those fluctuations and the natural fluctuations within the, the impoundment without using the traditional methods we're used to using. I created all these maps too, they're a little bit clunky, but um, so what I wanted to do again is take a look at you know where was the original dam, where we had seen some accretionary bars start to create to uh, pull in, and then why uh, you saw the response that you did within the river between the active channel in 2006 and the final stable channel that we see now, and that was within the 2012 lidar. Um, a, a lot of this has to do again with the. Uh, the geology of the reach itself and then where they chose to put the the secondary dam so the biggest problem with the the sandy and the reason the dam had to come out was in you know 1781 1784 you had the last uh, explosion of the mount hood that put a significant lahar deposit down the sandy river drainage channel when they built the dam in 1913 they of course had a lot of problem with the sediment build up behind that river or behind the dam and so they had chosen to move it further down from where they had put the dam in 1913, hoping that would alleviate the problem. But because the Sandy is still to this day trying to pulse the rest of that out, I think it's like 10 meters, currently 10 meters higher than where the Salmon River comes in at it. Um, so the, the thought was that would kind of slow down that increase of sediment into the impoundment and within uh, 10 years or 20 years they had to remove the dam part of that became the FERC license excuse me I, I shouldn't use so many acronyms FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission they are who they um, in conjunction with the Endangered Species Act tell you whether or not the dam has to have fish bladders what size the ladders have to be 
what their capacity is, and then anything else that could be considered structural degradation of the dam itself that would have to be up, uh, retrofitted or upgraded for the dam to have its license renewed. At the time that their FERC license came up, it was decided that it was cost prohibitive to do all this. And so in partnership with the local uh, natural resource agencies, they were able to remove the dam, which was a benefit to the you know, salmon on the river and allowed the river to run free and also solved a lot of the sediment issues and saved PGE a ton of money in trying to you know, continue to, to fix this. The removal of the dam took out a um, man-made lake was a big problem. And so that was one of the bigger uh, contentious side effects of the dam's removal was a lot of people used Lake Roslyn for recreation in Clackamas County area and were kind of upset that it disappeared. So this is just a real quick um, description of like what the impoundment looked like uh, when the dam was, you had the main active channel here, you have a couple of old um, Sandy River terraces. So when the Sandy, uh, the dams, of course, the dust, the dam, which allowed it to, you know, migrate a little further into the margins higher up. So all of these now are very large terraces, very steep angled slopes. Um, most of all of these points in the upper reaches were buried under sediment. This tiny, these, this bar right here, there we go. So this was, is that Lahar piece you see in the photo uh, of me at the start. So this was buried under the sediment. You had a bit of a side channel that kind of went over the top of it and around the main channel of the side. Um, all of these features here, here, and here came out of the channel in the river within the first year of it. So here we get into 2008 characteristic changes, and this is just in change from 2008 to the 2006. So again, here was where the dam was. Once the dam was removed, um, you had a, an initial active response from the river. It pulsed out within 60 days, close to 700,000 cubic meters of sediment. And this was an unprecedented amount. You can see though, you had a significant change within the one year after the dam was removed from the active channel margins of the pre-dam removal to the dam itself. And within that first year, you also started to see these secondary channels pop out and some pieces start to appear. So these, um, you get uh, four years after dam removal, you have significant change. You have an active channel here. You have in high flow, secondary channel flow that comes in here. These are now the old lahar, exposed lahar heads that have showed up out of the impoundment after the sediment was removed off the top of them. And then you start to get into a little bit of equilibrium. The, the channel has moved further to the east. Um, and it's being pushed around this brecated lahar tuff right here. Um, this piece, these pieces right here that started to pull out were the, the corner footings of the original dam that was from 1913. They had been buried under the sediment and it was with, by the 2011 uh, LIDAR, you could literally start to see the footings of them pull out of the LIDAR itself. The reason they had put the dam here is because they felt that the constriction here would have more issues. And the original structure, they floated logs down, they built this crib wood structure. They basically used things on site. So it was all rocks and sand and, and logs all right from the Sandy itself. And the Sandy is a highly competent river. Uh, when it's really, really flowing, it can move rocks about the size of Volkswagens. So it's uh, it's a it's a very flashy river. It's a very fast river. Um, it's one where you see lost life almost every year because people take it for granted because it looks fairly placid on top. But the Falweg, the area of highest flow moves a lot. It's not in the center, and because of the way the Lahar tufts that come in weather, they have a differential weathering that they put lips underneath the edge of the water. And what happens a lot of times 
is people will get sucked under that and the hydrostatic pressure will push them up underneath the air pocket in, of the lahar and then they have to kind of drag about later. So the, the river itself is one that uh, has a lot of mobility and a lot of motility. Um, here we see 2012, this is five years after the channel has pretty much reached quasi equilibrium. You're not seeing a lot of movement back and forth anymore. Um, to this day, this is the, the pattern that the channel continues to have. Um, you, it pulls down around the east pulls down around to the east, uh, has exposed the footings of that uh, crib structure. Over the years, it's undercut the structure further to a total there's about um, half of what I had originally found is left. It get, has been pulled into the river and then pushed downstream further. Um, you have a little side channel that in high enough flows, this will sheet flow over the top of this uh, gravel bar boulder bar and comes sliding down this inner channel here while still pushing around here uh, around coming around this uh lahar tuff and then you know working itself down here you still get you get laminar flows across the bar here every year it builds up vegetation and builds up sand below where the dam was and then in the winter flows it scrapes it all back off uh, you have gotten a significant beach that has formed up above the dam that used to all be just boulders. And um, and this piece right here has continued to accrete with some sand also. So you have fairly regular amount of aggradation and degradation on the reach itself with that adds a little bit of sand, pulls a little bit of sand off in what would be considered the quasi equilibrium stage of it because it's not pushing as it's not growing vegetation on those bars like it should be if it um, was completely stable and had cut down as far as it still could, wants to so the sandy is still responding after the you know uh, last lahar deposit that came in in the 1780s and just as another little tidbit the reason the sandy is called the sandy river is when Lewis and Clark came in, it was still thick and flowing with the Lahar deposit, and they named it the Quicksand River. So that's the entomology of that river right there. This is just a nice little profile comparison of the reach. Um, and actually, I'm going to go real quick back here. So the entire reach was from right up above the dam all the way up to what is the upper level of the impoundment or the nick point. The nick point is a little a meter to two meter or above relief in elevation within the river itself. <clears throat> this nick point represents the upper reach of the original 1913s impoundment. That retreat of the cut from point A up to this, they expected to take a couple of years and it happened within six months. So again, the Sandy is probably is a very highly competent river. They timed this in conjunction with October flows off of the mountain itself, so some of the bigger storms that come through, and um, we're able to mobilize that sediment in a significant manner. Um, some little plan profiles, a little bit of side change. Um, you have your main channel at the top, and then you have your little little hard dikes. And the terraces and this just shows how the river plopped down and then how it tried to move laterally and then how in that lateral movement it kind of reached itself semi equilibrium in <clears throat> the stages and so for this is sections d and e which are right so my transects came across the bar there uh, and this is so this is at that lahar dike itself so this is the 2007, you can't really see it. It's sort of there. You've got a sandbar that's been built up in front of it. So because of the way the river has flowed and because you had that Lahar dike there, you were basically getting sediment building up behind that Lahar and then it created a bar. So there was a little bit of a sandbar there. It was also one of the first things to mobilize once the, the dam came out because it was pretty much just consolidated sand. Also the way that the Lahar created an, an internal dam itself, it created a large boulder field up above it that was underneath the sediment itself. So 
when you pulled out the dam, you were able to mobilize the entrapped sediment that was over the large cobbles. And so that pulsed out first and then left these big, large boulder fields uh, perched. And so because it cut down so quick and left the perch to the boulder fields, it has to be, it would take a significant amount of discharge to remobilize any of those giant bars like that. <clears throat> and just a little bit further up. So this is, so the first cross section came across the top of this lahar here. And the second cross section came across the top of this bar. And this is what I was talking about with the gravel boulder field that was just, uh, just above or just in front of that Lahar dike itself. And there's again Ara kind of for scale to be able to see the size of rocks that it can move when the river gets to, to cooking, I guess is the time, my phrase. This is a little bit further up. These basically come right across the uh, crib structure itself. So this is just above uh, that Lahar and it's the main cute. And this was. A lot of the, a lot of what you see in the, the cutting of this portion right here was dictated by where they put the original dam. Because they put the original dam here and sediment had built up behind it to begin with, your spillways had carved trough downstream from it. So again, when they put the dam further down and that sediment built up, it built up into the, the troughs that had been carved by the original dam spillway. Does that make sense? So when they put in the newer dam, that sediment then continued to back up and it backed all the way up, um, well, all the way up past this towards the end of the impoundment. When the dam came out, you could walk above the dam in the reservoir and you were about at ankle depth water. That's how much sediment had built up behind the dam. So it was pretty much not doing its function anymore. So again, this came out of the uh, sediment pro the sediment impoundment around 2011. The flows that uh, the, the flows from the 2011 storm exposed these, and this was the easternmost crib corner of the dam itself. And so they would have made these little crib structures, filled them with rock and sand, and it would have connected wall to wall from this point. And so overall change just and again overall within the impoundment you had over 700 730 cubic meters of sediment removed i was more looking again at the fluctuations of sediment on the bars and the terraces themselves and not overall removal from the impoundment and then to see whether or not you know, it had it would get to a point of equilibrium. To get to a point of equilibrium, you're either getting you're getting kind of just to a net zero minor changes. And so we can see here 2011 to 2012, you're kind of just getting uh, aggregation, minor degradation, and a net positive change, but that flux is minor. So you'll sometimes some years you'll get a little bit of a removal still, some years you'll get an aggregation, but they're not huge, huge fluxes like what we saw right after the dam was removed. And the cool thing about the dam going out was the fact that you could see all of these changes really quick. So here we see the original wooden crib structure that they built, and that was that's that little piece that we see the corner of it. So that was what they used materials from the dam itself to put that in. Again, 87, they put in the rolled uh, concrete dam, which is what you see right here. It's a diversion dam was meant to, to pull water from the sandy push it up through uh, a flume, they called it the, what were they called, the devil's backbone, basically. So water went through this big, huge tunnel, connected up to water that was diverted from the Little Sandy, and then that was uh, then pushed up to Lake Roswell and it was part of the Bull Run power system for the, you know, powering, generating power for the area and then drinking water for the region too. So this is PGE doing the initial explosion and the, the start of the removal of the dam itself. Um, again, this was, a, this was a rolled concrete dam, uh, had a rebar basically tied, tied both directions, uh, six inches on center. So, I mean, it was significant. It took numerous blasts to be able to pull it down in sections. They did recycle all the material. They broke up all the concrete, turned it into road fill, 
all of the rebar got stuck into an uh, arc furnace and turned into reusable steel and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, it was a significant undertaking. Um, they also, I'll share a link to this one and the longer video. So there's a 30 minute video that kind of gets into a little bit more of the science. So they went to, uh, what is the name of it? I can't remember. So in back in off of the Mississippi, there is a group with USGS that does the hydrodynamics. You can basically create scale models of your reaches and you can run scenarios of what would happen if you decided to take out the dam or if you're going to do a stream restoration, what would the best way to do it? So they took the LIDAR that they got in the 2007, they created a, a scale model of the reach itself. They then uh, ran numerous scenarios on how they would effectively breach the dam and what was going to be the best way to breach the dam and what amount of CF cubic feet per second that's flow or cubic meters per second, what type of flow was going to be needed to be able to pulse the most amount of sediment out as possible. Because at the end of the day, it was important to not only free the river, but not disrupt salmon habitat downstream. So this was in conjunction with numerous uh, state and federal agencies, fish and live, wildlife were involved, um, lots of private entities, um, the, uh, the uh, Center for Watershed Council. I mean, so it was uh, kind of one of those all hands on deck things. It looks like we do have some questions. Yeah, I we have uh, one question from the chat that was pretty on topic to what we're seeing here, which uh, Larry was was asking if the sediment caused any issues downstream when it was released so much faster than we had anticipated it being released. As a matter of fact, it did not. They had uh, wrangled enough sab salmon out and the storm was significant enough in size um, that even if they hadn't wrangled out the mating pairs, it didn't it was disrupt any of the red. The, the beds, the red beds. Um, uh, so the the storm that came through was significant enough in outflow that it not it pulsed it not just out of the impoundment itself, but all the way down into the delta. You saw a little bit of bar creation downstream at Brightwood um, Dodge Park and then down towards Troutdale and um, the Delta itself. But within uh, the full year after that, it had kind of reached a, the more normal equilibrium and nothing had disrupted any of the natural systems for the, the fish or the macro invertebrates they would rely on. The, there was another question in the chat. I was also curious about this. Bonnie and Edith uh, were both asking about um, kind of the, what we're learning from this dam removal. Um, how applicable is it to future dam removals, specifically the Klamath, which uh, was just approved to be removed, and um, hopefully the Snake River dams that'll be removed in the near future as well. So this will be one of the largest, um, or excuse me, the ones prior to this. This is um, this one, and there's another one off of. Uh, Hemlock, the Hemlock Dam in Washington was another significant one. That was Is a that little... the Elwha River Dam? No. Oh, different. Elwha was that was different. That became later. So we got we kind of have Marmot that came first, and then right around the same time is the Hemlock Dam, which is um, also drains into the Columbia, but on the Washington side, it was another low head dam that was built around the same time that the Marmot was. So in the 1900s. From there, you kind of fast forward the lessons they learned on those. Both of them were blow and go type uh, uh, removals where they used the river itself to push the impoundment down. You then get into the removal of the two dams on the Elwha. And so those two were somewhat different. You had, you had a bit of a hybrid. So you had some drawdown with some uh, dredging of the sediment but then kind of a hybrid blow and go where you pulled out one side, let it come down and then, you know, coffer dam that and pulled out the other side, let that come down. And then they kept kind of going back and forth until it got enough of an entrainment and the banks were stable enough to not keep landsliding down that they would go from there. The Klamath River is going to be a very big undertaking. And it's interesting because I started following that when the first proposal came out in 2011 when it was when it was having issues with the FERC and originally it was only going to be two of the dams and then it went to three and now it's all four of them so that's huge that's great and so again we're, we're we're seeing that the benefits for these things 
the, the co they're cost prohibitive. So it gives you short-term benefit. You can, the amount of cost to, up, to maintain and upgrade those and keep them moving. And then the ecological cost to them is significant. So pulling them out and trying to figure out different ways to, to generate the same type of uh, benefit power-wise from them and water-wise can be done without having to create the disruptions that we did. So it's just it's just another one of those things for us to have a chance to take the science and what we've learned and the mistakes we've made and what we learned from those mistakes. I always learn more from my mistakes than I ever have from my successes um, and kind of go from there and do better moving forward. So Paul, Shia, and I both had the same question, Lowell. How well did the scale model predict what actually happened during and after the dam removal? Pretty good, actually. I mean, so the scale models predicted the level of storm that they wanted, which was approximately, if I'm, I'm going to try to pull it off the top of my head, 13,000 CFS is what they were looking for. And they got the they got one that was a little bit over that, right around 14. Um, and all of the predictions showed that if they had if they did that, it would uh, go so the high end extreme was a year short end was six months and it did it in pretty much the major amount of push of the sediment and the biggest amount of difference you saw was within the first 60 days it was just huge amounts and like overnight it had pretty much <laughs> retreated up to I want, I want to say a quarter of a kilometer up from where the breach was it was they were very impressed so all of the scientists involved were pretty amazed at how quick it pushed it out. And then the fact that they were their only, the only, the only thing they underestimated was how long it would take. They were correct in that it would push it out. They were correct that this level of storm was the amount you needed to mobilize that sediment to not cause disruption downstream. What they were off on was how long it would take to actually mobilize the sediment out of the impoundment. So. So I have kind of a, a bit of a vegetation follow-up question to that okay. is I expect they probably didn't anticipate the size of the Sandy River cobble that they ran that you have observed after after the finer sediments went out. So is somebody going to be tracking vegetation reestablishment through that stretch? I don't I figure it's probably not going to be you. You've been looking at the physical dynamics, but is somebody going to be now tracking how long it's going to take to revegetate and stabilize that new drainage basin, that new streams course? I believe there is somebody that has been writing a paper. I can't remember off the top of my head, but when I was working on this, um, Martin LaFrance had told me that it was somebody that was working on, you know, the vegetative aspect on the Sandy and what it was doing in response to that with equilibrium. From my own anecdotal or my name, whatever, my boots on the ground every weekend of this, um, the the sediment comes in and has covered the cobbles and it does revegetate during the spring and summer. You get a significant amount of vegetation. It's just the fact that the river hasn't continued cutting down enough for the, these bars that have built up to not get mobilized in a high flow. So we just had one, when we had the rainstorm last week, Sandy went all the way up to the point where when I can, I can walk down and I can basically do the, you know, arm to arm, side to side when I'm standing on the bar and I can see where the flow lines were and be like, oh yeah, this, the river was pretty much up to my neck if I had been standing here that time. But now I can stand on this now exposed, uh, gravel bar and re-engage uh, sediment. And that's another thing I like to do. So I go out on this thing and I it's right. So the area I like to take Ara out and go play is just down from where the dam was removed. And it's right where the USGS's cable tram is. So the old cable thing that we'd, you'd sit in to put your flow meter in the river during the middle of a storm to be able to figure out what was going on while it's swaying all over the place. Um, so, but that's really cool because the amount of sediment the amount of sand that has gone on that you kind of get to see at a micro level every year this bigger thing you see at the macro will come through it'll rework the sediment it'll push it down you'll see rivulets you'll see anastomoses and braids and all the things that you would see on a larger scale 
just really, really small. And so this is the nice thing about what we do is you can keep pulling it out to the larger scale. And so when you then get into like Missoula size floods, you can infer back by pulling even further out and being like, this same process here keeps working out to here. And, and again, it gets into that, you know, geography, physical geography is just how we explain the geology in space and time. And then that geomorphology is how that physical stuff we see is changing the geology over time. So. Wow. Well, Lowell, thank you so much because this is fascinating. And yes, do keep making your little trips out there because that's what is fun is watching those changes over time. Big time. We'll jump in and uh, Lowell, thank you again. We look forward to uh, working with you in the future on uh, other outreach and, and perhaps other field trips. And again, thank you, Andrew and Carrie and, and, and Emma. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you back. Uh, all of you.